think there are some profound ethical questions here, especially if it's not clear that you can bring back the person to a more or less normal state, to the, to, to the condition they were in before, without damage to the brain. So if, if it's not at all clear that you can do that, are there times when you should not bring that person back, even if medically you have the capacity to? I'll, I'll take it because I'm the neurointensivist, so I'm the brain um, we, critical care, if, if you don't we, mind. We're going to turn to him anyhow. Because <laughs> we call him in. Now, <laughs> so. But one of the big, one of, one of the, the other big interesting realizations for me was there's this thing that happens on the forefront of medicine, and I've seen it with, it happens with severe brain injury of all types, and cardiac arrest, when you're deprived of oxygen in a coma, we were taught that's the worst form of brain injury, this is process that we all know about called therapeutic nihilism. We're all taught that you're right, that's hopeless, and even if you bring the heart back, you're gonna do a terrible thing because this person is gonna suffer from brain damage and be in a permanent coma, which is vegetative state. Stand back and stop, don't even try. And this is really the conventional wisdom. This is the pervasive, this is standard operating procedure. And what we've come to learn is that those notions of the irreversibility of the brain damage are dead wrong. And we see these examples under less than ideal circumstances. The hypothermia is delayed or, or whatever that, you know what, the, you know, the conventional wisdom is wrong. And so it, th that's the crux of the ethical issue, sometimes trying to do the right thing ethically, right? But you know, if you make those judgments too soon without really going full out all the way, we may be actually writing people off. And that's why I think some of yeah. us become such zealots. So I mean, uh, maybe another perspective on it, because I, yeah, you got the choir up here, so you know. Um, <laughs> is that, um, so Peter Saffer was the person who developed mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation and CPR in the 50s in this country. And before that, n nobody knew how to do CPR. Nobody knew how to really do mouth to mouth. And when he said he was going to teach it to the public, it was something only a trained doctor could do. It was called cardiac massage at that point, you know. And he said, I'm going to teach this to the public. And there were letters that appeared in the journal that said, Dr. Saffer shouldn't do this because it will fill the hospitals up with brain dead people if you do that. And then when we moved AEDs, automatic external defibrillators, shock boxes, out into the airports, at O'Hare. We made them available to the public. Previously it was a technique only a doctor could do. Now an eighth grader could do it. We got letters. It said, you're going to fill the hospital up with brain dead people if you take this technology out <laughs> there. Okay? And when we started cooling in 2002 and 2003, people were concerned. They said, you're going to fill that hospital up with brain dead people, Dr. Becker. <laughs> okay? And as we now start to talk about some of these future things coming down, like putting a patient on an artificial pump that would be the equivalent of a heart and lung machine, ECMO, whatever you want to call that kind of a device, the letters that I get are, you're going to fill that hospital up with brain dead people, Dr. Becker. So the beautiful thing is, I just want to, we should sort of put that to rest because we actually have really good colleagues and ways that we sort that out and we, I think, treat patients on a very good individualized basis to figure out what patient is really beyond our ability to help them, what patient we can help. We're not going to fill the hospitals up with brain dead people. It's never happened yet. Are you saying this is not an ethical dilemma here? I, I think, well, I think it is an ethical dilemma, but it's in the following sense. The question is, should I be doing anything to save you at that point? There are absolute times, and we all have patients like this, where, where in a certain setting we make a decision that it's not appropriate to extend your life in an artificial way. And that's done, and everybody knows patients like that, and we've all made that tough decision. But the question is if we're going to do anything. I don't know why we would do less than everything we can to save a person. So, so the question is, why would you want to save somebody half? That's right. Right? And I've heard, I have colleagues who've said, well, we resuscitated this guy, his heart's beating, 
but I don't think he's really going to make it, so I'm not going to cool him down. And you're like, mm. really? You're going to possibly increase his neurologic injury right. yep. by not cooling him down, even though you've done all this? And that happens in hospitals yep. across this country every day, every minute in this country today. So, Sam, is this, has this been an ethical dilemma for you? Well, of course, you know, when, when you deal with emergency medicine, critical, critical care medicine, a lot of what we do is ethically bound. I mean, because there are, nothing is always black, uh, clear. It's not black and white. There's always shades of gray. But I think to, to re, really highlight what's already been said, there was a fascinating study published about a year or so ago which just looked at current practices across the U.S. over the last eight or so years with cardiac risk resuscitation in hospitals. And they looked at how long doctors would typically <laughs> perform chest compressions in hospital across 64,000 events. And they found that actually the majority of doctors would stop, and this is completely arbitrary, less than 20 minutes of time. Okay? And I always had a problem with that because I think, well, if you just decide to stop in an arbitrary fashion because you think the person's not going to do very well, for that person, that's a permanent death sentence, right? And what was astonishing was that actually, for every extra 10 minutes that people did, in the rare cases where people did go beyond 20 minutes, and the numbers dropped, of course, when you went to 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes, but survival to hospital discharge went up and up and up, which is basically illustrating the point that if you decide not to deliver treatment just because you think it's uh, not right, then of course it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course they're not going to make it. Of course they're going to be permanently brain dead if you don't cool them down. And so I think the bigger ethical dilemma is who are we not to deliver the right care? In my opinion, today, if somebody were to die, and if they were to die of a condition that is currently untreatable, then probably we shouldn't do anything for them. Because what's the point of restarting the heart? The person has cancer that's spread all over. There is no chemotherapy available anymore. And we're just going to go through this motion, but it can't stop the, f the fuel that's burning that fire. So in those cases, we probably shouldn't do anything. But on the other hand, you get a 56-year-old man who's had a heart attack with two children, and all of his other organs are fine, and he's just died from the heart attack. Why shouldn't we do everything for that person? Because if we do, we do put them on ECMO, we do cool them, we have a very good chance of bringing that person without brain damage and giving them back to society. And I think that's, that's the bigger ethical dilemma, that things are not being done that are currently available.